Hi, welcome to Black Ticulate, 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 a podcast series featuring UK young black professionals, where we find out how they do what they do, so you can too. Or not. After all, it is your life. <laughs> all right, y'all. Um, welcome to another episode of Black Ticulate. Now, based off the feedback you guys have given me, you guys want me to introduce what to expect in each episode before the episode plays. So, you should expect something amazing. Um, and I'm playing. I'm not playing, actually, because everyone I do get on my podcast are amazing. And in today's episode, we get to be introduced and meet Anne-Marie Imafadon, who is nothing short of amazing. She is a child prodigy, a genius in mass and languages. And she's actually got a Guinness World Record for being the youngest to pass two GCSEs while still at primary school. We talk about that. We talk about her background being Nigerian growing up. You know, we talk about her time at university in Oxford, specifically Nando's. Um, <laughs> yeah, no jokes. We talk about Nando's. Um, and just exactly how she does what it is she does. And what does she do? Well, she's the founder of a non-for-profit organisation called STEMETS, which is all about trying to get girls into STEM careers. STEM careers are science, technology, education and maths. And she pretty much gives stellar advice on how to do that. So this is a great episode. Hope you enjoy it. As always, give me any feedback you got so I can try and make these, these Black Ticulate episodes better and better each time. All right, guys, see you on the other side. <laughs> guys, guys, uh, welcome to another episode of Black Ticulate. I've got a treat for you. I've got in front of me Anne-Marie, two Nigerian names that she doesn't know how to pronounce. Anyone, not gonna bother. anyone, yeah. anyone. <laughs> um, and Mafidon. I normally, as you know, I normally throw it straight to the guests for them to tell you guys who they are and what they do. We normally take it from there. But before I do that, actually, I'm going to let you know, this might have not happened, you know, Anne-Marie was a, I don't like to say CPT, but <laughs> I was like, hey, um, are we still on today? And she goes, yeah, 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 I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> I, I've left my house, I promise, I promise. <laughs> I'm putting you on blast straight away. Anne-Marie, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. So, like I mentioned, I do normally just throw it straight to the guests and just ask what they do and how they do it. So... What do you do? And then we'll get into how you do it. Sure. So um, I run a not-for-profit called STEMETS, which is all about encouraging and inspiring girls and young women into science, technology, engineering, and maths-related careers, um, known as STEM. STEM, yeah. right, yeah. And you've been doing that for the last three years. I've done so my been, research. Yeah, yeah, you have done your research. I've been doing it for three and a half years, but I've only been full-time for the last eight months, eight, nine months. Okay. How comes? Because uh, there's only 24 hours in the day, and I couldn't find the 25th hour. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you looked at me so so, of, so cold, like I just like couldn't find just, the hours. It was quite frustrating, actually. Right. If there were 25 hours in the day, then I'd be doing. I'd have carried on doing it part time alongside my role in an investment bank. So that, so investment banking. I mean, I'm going to almost try and join all your dots to see where we've landed to mm -hmm. date. Mm -hmm. But I guess investment banking was what earn enough for you to be able to confidently decide, you know what, well, I can now do this officially full time um, because I've got enough finances? Almost, or... not really. Okay. So, so investing in, so I was working in tech and investment banking. Right. And um, it gave me, so the opportunities that I got while I was there led me to start Stemets and start running Stemets. Okay. Um, and so I kind of leaving there wasn't really a financial decision. It was literally about time and about um, being open to other opportunities that might not have worked with what the nature of my contract was when I was there. Right. So okay. financials has not been an impact, that much of an impact on me. Gotcha. All right, guys. So obviously you can do multiple things because it's auditory. So check out stemx.org, is it? Mm -hmm. Non-profit. Non-for-profit. the Twitter and the Insta. And the Twitter and Insta. We're yeah, going to definitely get how... Yeah, yeah. You're about that. I think, quote, you said Twitter life. is life. Yes, Twitter is life. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to try and get into the background and literally all about you because you've got really quite a fascinating story. You're the eldest child of the Brainless family yeah, in someone, Britain. Yeah, someone said that, yeah. And you've got that all over your Twitter. Yes. Um, but how I actually came to know you was actually you did a talk 
on Google for Black History Month, right? And then I saw you in Shoreditch House, you and your friends, just, <laughs> they were bougie guys, they were bougie, just chilling with drinks. I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> this is black excellence right here. I need to get you. Oh, and I think goodness. I threw in an elevator pitch, dead and dead. And you were yeah. like, listen, Ade, just get on my Twitter and then we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> I said it on Twitter and it happened. And that's exactly why you're here. Half an hour so, later, but we're here. Yes, um, you are intelligent by all accounts, is that fair to say? And that's to do with family background. Your, what do your parents do? I mean... So my dad's an ophthalmologist and my mum's a linguist. I don't know what either no, of those no, are. No, I know no, what no. a linguist is. Yeah, so <laughs> linguist is the language end, so yeah. she was quite upset that tech was a tech and maths were my thing and I didn't like reading. Right. Um, but my dad's an ophthalmologist, which is like an optician, but does more of like the research and the high level stuff that tells opticians what they end up doing. Academia runs through and through. Yeah, in fair? some ways, yeah, in some ways, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. But less traditional academia, more just like a learned profession. A learned profession. Yeah, <laughs> being articulate. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So tell me about, where did you grow up then? Tell me about your upbringing. Grew up in East like London. In, where specifically? Um, so between Leighton, Stratford, Walthamstow, those kind of areas. Anyone from there? Woo, woo. <laughs> yeah, in the house, all the E, all the postcode. E17, E10. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so I grew up in East London and went to local primary school. Nothing special about that. Um, nothing too auspicious. But how did you then start, I guess, with all due respect, you started excelling and started becoming, well, this known genius per se. I mean, but obviously you've got a world record, which I think still to date hasn't been broken. As far as I know, yeah. So, right. um, yeah. so all of that came up more. So with going to primary school, normal primary school, whatever. Um, a a rascal. Did, did the classes. Yeah, I did the classes. I was more of a rascal at secondary school, but anyway, we'll get to that. So um, primary school, kind of, you go along, you do things. Everything kind of repeats itself after a while and it's good repetition because that's how you learn right but it kind of got to a point where maybe year four year three they'd already said everything already and i already kind of remembered it from the first time around so things were a little bit easier for me than they might have been for some other students okay um so my my year four um teacher kind of said to my parents well there's a lot going here you should look into you know what you can do to help support her you know what else she can be doing that's amazing teachers who it's really good can like, recognize you know that. shout out to teachers um, who do that yeah and um i think at this point the kind of year after my cousins were doing gcse so i kind of had an idea of what it was and you know how you always want to be like your older brother or yeah. sister there my cousins are like my older siblings because i'm the oldest right and um, so it was like okay yeah i'll do this try this gcse thing how hard could it be right they're doing it i can do it and um, so ended up doing two gcse's in year five year six as it was so i was 10 at one in maths and one in ICT, and I passed them both. Well, as <laughs> as that is. And it's funny because looking back. I passed an A or just like a C? So it was or a B and a C. And then um, it's one of those things that I think I didn't, you never really know. And it's, to this day, whenever I try something or do something, you never really know how it's going to go, but it just worked. So mm. it wasn't, I think some people were like, yeah, I knew. I always knew I was going to do that. Whereas I didn't, don't, don't, don't take it for granted that it happened. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I did those two. Pass was enough for me to go on and do the next step, which would be an A-level. So then did an A-level in computing. Right. Um, and then passed that as well. And that was an am- a computer and an amalgamation of math and ICT, I guess. Um, because well, I'm quite curious to know why you chose those two subjects to do G- in GCSE. So math was always going to be the thing. Tech has always been something I've quite loved, quite enjoyed, quite enjoyed taking things apart, putting them back together and creating things. Right. So... You know, just to see ICT is like, you're talking about like mouse or the floppy disk or the what, and there's all this kind of stuff that I knew already. I reckon there's some listeners, floppy disks? <laughs> <Hey, what? laughs> yeah, there you go, right? This is showing my age almost. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't that hard. I think the link between the two was a lot more obvious by the time I got to university. Right, so, fine time. And kind of all of computing is built on maths principles. And um, before you even did computer science at universities, it was a part of the maths department for quite a lot of them. So, um, for example, my black my computer science sorry teacher or tutor at university or lecturer, as it were, at university, and um, 
had actually read maths and computer science was a part of what he did as his kind of senior maths work. Right. So computer science is rooted in a lot of maths and like this branch called decision maths and quite a lot of stuff that goes on is quite based on probabilities as well. So there's a whole load of interesting things actually. Talking about algorithms, which we all recognise as computer science yes. thing, kind of they rely on quite a lot of maths to back up the fact that they will work or won't work. So um, they are linked. Yeah, no, no, I see yeah. that. I mean, I thought that, but I mean, I was just wondering whether or not that was purposely done and someone almost channeled you and go, okay, because you love ICT, you love maths. Oh, no, but I had like languages as well. And mm. they, they like, it's this, the same part of your brain, but they don't, they don't all necessarily logically fit together. Yeah. I mean, we're always trying to make sense of things, aren't we? Like, that's why we tell stories, to, yeah. make, to help the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's exactly. just logical. Same sort of thing. I just hated writing, just never really liked working with words. Okay. Unless it was French words, so I love writing in French. Okay, really? I'd read, I'd read French. If I had more time, I'd read French books. Did you, are you fluent? French? I was fluent, not anymore. Oh. I'm like pseudo-fluent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that counts. I can get by. I could probably, I could do a meeting in French. I could do a business meeting in French. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, that's amazing. Then you are, you're bilingual in that sense. If you can do a business meeting could and get call it that. Done. Yeah. yeah so it's like that. business level French. Another thing to the CV. There you go. Tick. All, the lang- all the languages. So I'm with you now officially, obviously, in A-level. You've now passed and you've graduated quite early, I yeah. guess, from your peers. Yeah. And I think, so the natural progression was then I have to go to university, right? Yeah, at some point. You went to Oxford, was it? Or yeah, Cambridge? Oxford. Oxford, apologies. Why Oxford? Apart from obviously my Jeff So I'm um, <laughs> No, so it wasn't even them. What? Like, people don't believe me, but this is true. So when I was 13 at school, they made us do a, um, like one of those careers questionnaires. Like, so ask questions, do you want to work outside? Uh, are you good at working with others? Blah, 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 blah. Right, all these questions. Yeah. So I answered it and got to the end and it said I should be a management consultant. That was like the number one thing I should be. And number two was systems analyst. Right. I'd never heard of management consultant before. Yeah, they age of 13. You know, you've seen it on television, right? So I had yeah. no idea what it was. So I looked it up and saw that um, at this point, for some reason, in this resource, it was saying that you're 16 times more likely to get a role as a management consultant if you have any degree from Oxford. And so that was like strike one for Oxford. And the second thing was um, realising that Oxford is a city with the university in the city. So yes. like, things happen outside the city and there's like a whole life and there's like Nando's and whatever and blah, 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 right? Whereas Cambridge is just like a sleepy town right. and there's nothing else there. Other than the did university. you say Nando's? I did, did I say, say I heard you say, say Nando's. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, am I going to let her get away I with did, that? I did say that. You know, there's a lot of things going on outside. <laughs> Nando's. Not, I was like, like, yeah. you know, there, were, there were two Nando's by the time I left in Oxford. <laughs> I was on first name um, basis with everyone that worked in the, the second one. You got that extra. But like, nice. it's one of those things where I kind of, as a Londoner, as an yeah. East Londoner, right. I can't just move to the countryside. It's still something that plagues me now. Yeah. So, you know, my forever home that I want to buy when I, you know, have all the money that I ha- will have in my life to buy will still be in East London. Like right. I'm, I'm not going to leave town or go and live on an island or whatever. East London is my paradise. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so Oxford was almost closer to East London, but also it meant that I was more likely going to become a management consultant when I was done. Oh, fair play. Yeah. And so for age of 13, I'm like, okay, Oxford is my, uh, that's it's my ticket. That's where we're going. It's yeah. my ticket. Whatever I do, which is nice. Yeah. That's where I'm going. And so then you obviously applied at a time where you already, did you have fame? And because, you know, obviously GCSE, so, yeah, so that had been did that 10. help? So by the time I applied, um, it helped in that, um, well, not really. I mean, oh, okay. it, it helped in that it verifies that I had the grades more than just having, like, just saying you've got the grades on your certificate or whatever, or contacting the exam board. But it didn't help more than that, if that makes sense. Okay. So it wasn't like Because isn't there quotas? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this quotas out Quotas like what? Like, as in the racial, like, bringing black people. Say for instance. No, there's no okay. quotas. Quotas to try and get if more. If they do, I don't think they're, they're filling them. I mean, this year probably is the first year that they've managed to reach a quota per se. Yeah. But they definitely don't have quotas. Okay. Like because I, I went, you, I went to the boarding school. Yeah. And pre- there was eight hundred boys. Yeah. I could count how many black people throughout the entire school. Five people. Right. And the reason why I got my. Uh, Oh, it was like their service to the community type Do you know thing. what I mean? It's almost like a, it's like oh. a prospectus, like, oh, here we are, we're diverse. Yeah, Oxford is a little bit different from that, okay. just a little bit. So I think um, this is why actually they've struggled. This is why I think they've struggled over the years to actually fill that quota or kind of up the numbers of black and minority ethnic people they've had at the university. Um, so the way that you're admitted, it's not a centralised system. It's quite different from other universities. Okay. So I don't know that. Um, it's your professors or your lecturers in your college who select you. 
rather than it being like an overall because I mean if you've got like 30 odd colleges you can't say across all 30 10% you need to be because then everyone will just assume that someone else is going to take that responsibility type yeah. of thing um, but also their lectures like you've seen what academics can be like before you can't really rule them yeah, no, <laughs> they yeah. kind of do what they want so it wasn't it was less of a quota thing um I mean, I'm not doing a year of service. I'm sure, yeah. obviously. No, 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 not at all. No, I mean, I got there and I finished. So even if it was, you know, for quotas, then I didn't need the quota. I think right. it almost counted against me actually because I was so young. Okay. Because for some of them, it's almost controversial to say that you're going to take a young person and let them go straight through, rather than letting them live their life and travel and mature and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, um, it's actually, initially there were a couple of colleges who wouldn't take me. Because of my age. Because of your age. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, sorry. I, 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 felt, yeah, I told you like this yeah, conversation, yeah, it's a conversation, it's so all good. it's going to go back no, into it. I've never right? actually talked to anyone about that, so yeah. No, I mean, well, if, I, if, I, me. if I can be candid again, obviously I, I do my research and everyone I actually have as guests just, you know, not enough where it just, it's going to be that one way sort yeah. of conversation where I'm just hearing it elsewhere. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I find, or I've noticed, and please correct me if I'm wrong, your mission and your agenda, first and foremost, is obviously getting females mm -hmm. into STEM mm -hmm. careers. Mm -hmm. But I don't ever hear you speak about race. Mm -hmm. And you must be fighting two fronts here. I mean, you can't help but. So or do you sort, not sort see of, it? Again, again, this is a discussion I was having with someone this morning. So okay. um, when we talk about STEM, at least in the UK, and this is something that I've said before on stage, when we talk about black and minority ethnic, they're actually overrepresented in industry, given what percentage we are in the population. Um, and then also what percentage we are at higher education as well in these STEM subjects. So if we don't count apprenticeships or other routes into industry, um, we're heavily overrepresented on university courses in science, technology, engineering and maths as black and minority ethnic, yeah. I don't know that. Um, and everybody says they don't know this. And then you get into industry and you see that actually um, the stats are sparse, so no one has actually been able to count and say this is the entire percentage across the whole industry. They measure women, they measure other things, but they don't necessarily measure race. Um, partly because of I thought laws they did, and collecting they? recruitment. No. If what you, was that McKinsey, me, that McKinsey the, report? Tell me the number of, of black people in the UK working in the tech industry. I don't know about the UK Do specifically. You know, exactly. It's so the US. It's always US stats. You yeah. never have UK stats. So. For me, it's been a bit I'm of an really interesting something one. about that. Well, I've got enough on my plate, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so for me, it's been a, a bit of an interesting one because the other thing that I've seen has been, so there have been situations I've been in where, okay, we're already overrepresented in university. I turn up on an internship of 50 people, eight of them are black girls, and I'm getting confused as to who's who within the, within the eight black girls. Right, and I've, I've lived that situation. Right. I know it's only anecdotal, and it's probably, oh, the eight of us are unique. <laughs> Maybe, let's yeah, say. Definitely. But it's one of those ones that then, if I look at the wider problem of women, which is 50% of the population versus kind of double digits that it is for uh, black and minority ethnics, there is a well-documented, well-stated, statistically backed up problem that we're talking about there of bias or whatever you want to say the problem is. And actually the impact of affecting that bigger target audience, that includes some black and white ethnic course, women, yeah. that includes, um, even if you're going to you know, talk about any other kind of aspect of their life, hitting that 50% and increasing that 50% is pretty impactful, a lot more than necessarily affecting a small population okay. that already has the markings of being overrepresented within the industry. So for me, it was quite important to kind of, I'm, a, I'm still a mathematician, I'm still a scientist at the heart, so you kind of, you set your hypothesis and then you work at that and work at trying to change what that reality right. is going to be. Um, so that's why STEMETS as a whole is women and girls or young women and girls, whatever race, whatever class, whatever anything else that you want to say. Um, the other thing that I've then found by doing that is that because I'm so visible as the head of that and because my team, you've seen parts of my team, my team is quite diverse as it is, yeah. that's meant that we've been able to then, if we need to, feed into you know, Muslim radio and kind of that sort of yeah, culture no, or feed into um, uh, Filipino girls or feed in, you know, all that kind of thing. The things that we're representing the team because we're so public because on our Instagram, on our Snapchat, wherever it is, you see all the kinds of different people that we have. Then it's meant that actually we get a lot more black girls in our programme yeah. than anyone else does when they run similar programmes because they, they see me. I've even been in meetings before where I've been invited along. So I did something with uh, Mayor Bloomberg a couple of years ago 
and kind of the team reached out and were like, yeah, okay, cool. So we're at this round table with 15 of us. And then one of them beforehand was like, oh, okay, so is your organization for, for um, what did they say? What was it? What they did? For black or whatever, Very you know, whatever the, no, no, the American term, I can't remember what the American term it is, but um, African American. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, are they African American? But obviously they're not African American because this is the UK, right? Right. And I was like, no, but he'd assumed that because I was a black lady running the organization that it was for that. And a lot of people end up assuming that as well. So I feel like I've always, without being overt with it, I've I've also been able to feed into that audience of young black women right. and black girls. Um, I get that, but you don't necessarily put that first and foremost as your stamp. First and foremost is actually I want first and just foremost gender. is girls of all, uh, yeah. girls of all of all backgrounds, all whatever it is. And and the issue for me is that you know if it would all, I'd be doing everyone a great disservice if I say it's just black people that are missing from the industry or just black women that are missing from the industry. Mm. Um, Poor girls, rich girls, you know, girls in the north, girls in the south, wherever you are, whatever you are, being a girl is your disadvantage, right? Or is your, um, yeah, is your is your social disadvantage more than anything else? And again, you know, studies show there's a new one that came out a couple um, months ago that was saying that actually, when you talk about banking or other industries and getting access, you immediately go to socially disadvantaged, right? And you count free school meals and you see where they grew up and you count how many cars their parents had and all these kind of other poverty measures. Mm. Whereas when you talk about STEM, all of that is completely blown out by the gender. So you could be a white working class boy and you're a lot more likely to go into technology than if you are the richest, whitest girl living in the nicest area in the whole of the UK. Right. And you said, and I think, again, I might be misquoting you, but you just believe it's because of role models, first and foremost, one of the issues? So role models is one of it. I think there's a, it's a multifaceted, it's a yeah, multifaceted problem. And so there's a lot of different solutions that you can be. And, you know, in choosing such a big group, I guess it would have been easier for me to choose just black women because they're yeah. like, easy to understand, homogeneous maybe, than if you choose all women. Right. Um, but yeah, that role models is one of the big things. Visible role models is one of the big problems, one of the big reasons why we don't have as many. Right. Um, and so we work with it just as hard to make sure that the role models we put in front of the girls are as diverse as they can be. So we, we do have black women yeah. involved in what we do, and we do have all kinds of people. And predominantly that actually is all due to, well, to media, first and foremost, isn't it? Like it is media. As far as growing yeah. up with, because what you were growing up and you, like you said, you like disseminating things and just putting it back together. Yeah. And people just thought, well, that's you, that's yeah. what you do. So yeah. it wasn't an issue per yeah. se, but you think, I don't want to, I don't want to ostracize and go white or anything, but like in a Western, context a lot of girls if i may say that are siloed yeah you know they're, they're pigeonholed into certain yeah. things and whether it's conscious or unconscious it, it definitely happens quite a lot um and it happens this isn't easy you know, then is it what you're tackling no it's not not that easy and will it ever get to a stage where it's just it's not even seen now like you know that idea of gender specific oh yeah very much hope so yeah i, I definitely think we'll get there um, I hope that we get there sooner rather than later. Okay. So I had a great career and I kind of yeah. So let's let's. Don't want, didn't, I put it on hold to solve this. I don't want to still be doing this in my sixties. <laughs> oh, you don't. No. no. Hey guys, before we return to the episode, I just wanted to say I appreciate you listening, and if you'd like to get involved, then please visit www.blackticulate.com for more information. Now let's get back to the episode. And people are like, what's the long-term goal for Stimets? I'm like, I'm hoping that we'll be able to shut up shop yeah. and go and do something else in our lives. Yeah, that'd be well, great. They, I, well, that's a great redundant. question, because yeah. I'm wondering, what does success look like? So success looks like, and um, we've kind of... You've got this question before, you know? The well, way yeah, Anne-Marie, the, the way you just went back, and you just went, all right, let me just roll a deck. <laughs> yeah, that was the answer. I've got this yeah. file, I'm going to take this one out. <laughs> yeah. um, so yeah, no, so success is... For us, yeah. success will be 30% representation in the industry. Okay, what is it at as a moment? 14 now, we were at 13 when we started, and we're going for 30, 3 zero, Right. Or just above 3 zero. Then, if we have that, that's kind of where you start to see the tipping point, and kind of then okay. it starts to become normal. Right. Um, so that's what we're going for. Let's go back into, so obviously, investment bank, investment banking, you're in a sort of tech department. Do you mind yeah, telling me? Yeah, yeah, What were you doing exactly? Um, so loads of different things. I guess you okay. do different roles, but um, anywhere between the costs and kind of accounting for our servers to being able to charge internally for our own cloud to social collaboration tools internally. So all kinds of different things that we're doing there. And what do you, what was... What was the specific, the new one? So do you have to code? Do you have to build a software? Or everything. So you have to Jeez. talk to people, listen to what they needed, 
build like a bit of a solution on an existing platform or build it from scratch or develop whatever it is, like all kind, the whole gamut. Because I talk, to, I can talk to people and listen mm -hmm. as well as building. Then that meant that that ended up being kind of where I was sat. So I was almost like a internal consultant on certain platforms. Right, gotcha. And was anyone above you or below you? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had a, a yeah, a manager and a boss. Yeah, it's bank, so it's very hierarchical. I was going to say, and yeah. very, very mill skewed, I imagine. Uh yeah, yeah, yeah. but not overt, not always overtly so. Sometimes, but not all the time. It wasn't hell. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Oh, was it? Okay, it wasn't. I was wasn't really upset great. when I had to leave. Oh, really? Yeah. Stamets was almost, it was getting a lot. So, like, if you've got a part-time thing, you can do it on the weekends or whatever. Whereas this was like, I'd be in Rome on a Tuesday right. <laughs> for Stamets. And I'd land and I'd go to my hotel and then I'd be on a call for, my, for the bank. And then I'd go and speak on stage and then I'd leave the stage and then I'd have to jump on, like, another call and, like, help someone or something else. So it was like, yeah, I like my sleep. Stop. Yeah, you like uh, you sleep. I don't want to be exhausted. I also want to be in Rome and kind of enjoy being in Rome and talking to different people. Yeah. And, um, you know, the bank were really supportive the whole way, but it just came to the point where I was like, I can't do both. Yeah, I can't so, stretch yourself that much. No. No, oh, okay. And I can always come back to it. Do you, do you enjoy talking? Like um, going public speaking and whatnot? Yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. You, was that something you just found naturally it came to you or do you have any sort of... Yeah. Process like to get yourself ready. Oh no, none of that. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, so it's really funny. So, I, so I don't. You know, some people have to like, I don't know, do like exercises or jump or all that kind of stuff. Don't really have to do that because yeah. I'm always talking about the same things. So it's not that hard, right? Really, for me to prepare, and I'm not nervous. We were talking about it in the office the other day actually, because I'm trying to coach some of the team to be able to speak as well. Public speakers, yeah. And um. And they're like, but what if this goes wrong? Or what if no one believes you? Or what if people ask you tough questions? Or what if they ask you... And I, like, it, there's no downside to any of those situations, really, for me in my head. So I don't really get nervous or worried or... Is that a confidence thing that was just built up from, like... Maybe. Up, yeah. Upbringing? Maybe. Because there's something about you where, with all due respect, I don't think many people are like you. In fact, seldom are two things ever the same. I mean, we know that, right? Yeah. From my audience perspective as well, I'm always trying to... Just trying to chip away little nuggets, like where they can potentially see. But well, actually, I'm a bit like Anne Marie. Yeah, yeah. I do that. Maybe I, then I should consider going into a STEM career, oh, etc. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. you know, just I'm always trying to get the person behind, I guess, the public face and stuff. Yeah. Like, where are you? <laughs> pretty much what you see on the tin. <laughs> I'm not this like, I'm not like, you know, in Shrek when they're like, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. There's one, Duncan. there's one. You're onion. <laughs> And you open the coconut, and then that's his line. Like, there's, like, there's nothing else. Coconut's quite funny. But anyway. Um, yeah, that's quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Open the Maltese, I don't know. No, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, um, I don't know. What am I like? Do, do, so do I like that? Do I do what? Do you get that? Do you get being never referred to as coconut, bounty, etc.? No, okay, not really. Right. Okay, so. Well, yeah. No, like, no. Because you're even really. there. I'm not. I'm not. No, um, I think. So, what am I like? I'm very much what you see on the tin. Um. I'm quite confident, but I do like, I like to ask questions, I like to understand how things work. So maybe that could be one thing. If you're that kind of person that's like, but how does that work? How logically, how is it going to be? How would I recreate that if I was going to do that? Or, you know, if that's what happened in situation A and that's what happened in situation B, if you then give me situation C, what does logic dictate will happen? So I, I kind of think that way quite a lot. Okay. Um, so that would be one thing. I think if, I'm also quite creative. Right. So I like coming up with ideas and making them happen. So that could be another thing. If you're, if you think, if you ever feel like you think differently or you're on a different wavelength from people, or, um, you can kind of see one thing from sports and see another thing from art, and then you make you apply that somehow in food or you know that kind of thing. Yeah. Absolutely. So kind of being able to draw parallels because you don't see it as a sport thing. You see like the logic of what happened. Mm. And then you can take that logic and marry it together with, with logic from somewhere else. So I'm that kind of person as well. Okay. Um, and I think I am as well quite a quite an optimist. So, you know, even with things like public speaking, we were talking yesterday or the other day about what if they asked me hard questions? Well, yeah, that means that they were with you the whole way, thinking about what you were saying. If they've asked you a tough question, that's good because it's you know it's a new thing to explore. If you don't know the answer, then that's fine. It just means it's a bit of work for us to do to then work out whether that answer impacts what we're doing at all. Yeah. So it's, I kind of, I've got a very positive spin on things in general. Um, what, what gets you annoyed in and angry and how do you navigate that? Mm, uh, what 
what annoys me. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, so, I mean, uh, we on Friday this week, there's got to be something potentially that was irritating. And oh, what this week? Well, not just this week, but I'm just no, so just what, to help. What you annoys me is when um, I didn't. I, so I, it doesn't annoy me too much. So things that annoy me are when things move incredibly slowly, okay. a lot slower than they need to be moving. So that really, really annoys me because it's getting there quicker kind of thing. Um, things that annoy me are when people are overly selfish as well. You get that a lot in business where people are quite selfish with what they're doing and with what we're, as a not-for-profit, I think um, people people sometimes are quite selfish and it's, quite, it's almost fine for you to be selfish in business, but if we're doing things with a slightly more magnanimous aim, then there's no need for you to drain our resources, for example. So things like, we get asked, I get asked to speak a lot, and if it's a free event and you've asked me to speak at a free event for free, then that's fine. Yeah. But if you're charging however much for a ticket and you ask me to speak for free, then that yeah. is really taking advantage. Sorry. So if it's, a, if it's a charged event, if it's a ticketed event where people have paid quite a lot for tickets and you've asked me to speak for free, that annoys me a lot because you're taking advantage, you're not valuing my time no, over no, no, no. the value that you're placing on my time because you're charging all the people to come and see me. Yeah. So things like that quite annoy me. Um, so yeah, when people don't value stuff, in that way, or value us or me or my resources, then that also annoys me. But I think I'm fairly, I'm fairly happy. So like um, things that might annoy, for example, our team or our board. So when other people start running events for girls and they're almost copying what we're doing, or like the Twitter account or whatever, might annoy others. Whereas for me, I'm confident enough in what we're doing that I don't really mind if someone else say, does the same thing. Does that they say imitation is a sign of flattery? Or yeah, you can call it that if you that? want. Yeah, but then it is still imitation, right? So I still am going to do what I'm going to do first, and then you can do it afterwards. Yeah. If you're still going to, sorry, if you're still going to copy yeah. me. Um, so yeah, so I'm not really fussed. I, I feel you've got really quite a uh, well logical, definitely, but very measured head on your shoulders yeah, from a professional yeah. context. Yeah, does that. Also translating to your family, your brothers, your sisters. I don't know. Oh, well, them sisters. being measured. No, <laughs> no. Because I'm one of five, right? <laughs> and like, when you're one of five, everyone's very different. So everyone does their own thing. Yeah. So we're all very different personalities. Right. Um. So yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm measured when it comes to dealing with my family. I don't know. I'm gonna have to ask them, aren't I? Are they yeah. doing amazing things? Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Cool. Then we're gonna I mean, get them on black ticket as well. I don't know. If, I think they're. Um, so I'm the oldest, so that the rest of them, are, you know, doing anything younger. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think. Yeah, I'm quite measured in everything. I'm quite measured in a lot of things. I'm quite like laid back. Quite so quite like just, just get it done really. Yeah, no, I get that. I, I, I mean, I get the sense of that. The fact yeah. being the eldest sister as well, I guess you have to look after them. Exactly. You know, it's cook food, muscle, yeah. Muscle, yeah. Muscle, no doubt. <laughs> so you get used to doing that, to being the natural leader and making no. sure everybody does what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. A hundred percent. I'm pretty much going to like almost open this out to you because I'm again very aware of your time and guys, you obviously know I always try and put it to between 35 to 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. So STEMX, tell me about it. How can we get involved? And yeah, let's start with that. So, um, Sister so Metz is, so the moment we run, or we are based in London, but run events and run workshops all over the UK and Ireland, everything we do is always free for the girls, it's always fun, and there's always food for the girls, because um, food's pretty important, free food tastes better than yeah. not so free food, <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, so that's what we do, we are, at the moment, so we've had about 10,000 girls go through our different events and things that we've run in the last three years. And we're at the moment going from 10,000 trying to reach 2 million girls. 2 million is that kind of a third or 33% of all the eligible girls in the UK that could attend our events. And when I say girls, I mean between 5 and 21. Right, okay. So kind of people almost see us like a women's network, which we're not. We're kind of no alcohol at our events because of the age of them. Yeah. And once you've graduated, it's kind of, once you've, in fact, once you've started your first job, then you've kind of gone too far for us and there are other networks that you can get involved with. Okay. Um, so that's what we do. And um, our next phase involves quite a lot of um, kind of community building and network building and empowering young women to do what we do, but in their local communities, in their local school, wherever they are. Um, and also quite a lot of media work as well. So we've had a... 
sitcom commissioned by BBC Three. Oh wow! That's like Glee, but the, it's all girls and they all code. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> so we've got those kind of projects that are coming up. We've got a documentary that's out in September as well. Congratulations! So I think the work really, or what I think the biggest support we could get is people just spreading the word. Right. Just more um, brand awareness. Yeah, about about what we're doing, what we're up to, and um, also being aware that you don't want to be the roadblock, you know, in the way of the next big thing, right? I don't want to say Steve Jobs or Einstein or another pale male style name, but kind of be aware of the girls that you've got around you, what their aspirations are, you know, some of the things that make them tick, whether they're creative, whether they're altruistic, and being making sure that you're supporting them and not laughing at them if they want to build a mobile app or if they want to become an engineer or if they want to, you know, go into certain fields that you might not think would be typical of someone like that, yeah. you know, stop yourself internally, you know, have a, be more aware of all things like that. What was your, I'm going to, sorry, because this is just phenomenal and I almost wanted to bring it, what was your first step? Okay, so you had this idea three and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing you did, bar obviously branded? I wrote a blog. Um, so I wrote a blog. Why? Because I wanted, when you're starting something new, um, it's always a really good idea for you to be open about your reasoning for why you're starting it and why there's a need for it. And not in a way that kind of exposes you or reveals your secrets or whatever, but for things like social enterprise, let's say, like I'm running, or even if I was going to start, you know, another more profit focused business, you always want to be really clear and have people along on the journey of you of why you're doing what you're doing. So I wrote this blog post and sent it to a couple of different people that I knew in industry. So it's really frustrating, you know, going back again to black people in tech thing. I know a lot of black people in tech because I'm in the industry. You yeah. know, no one else knows them or knows that they're there, but I know, I know them because I'm in it, right? Yeah. So I kind of reached out to a couple of women in tech that I knew that were doing various different things, doing interesting things. Said, okay, cool, this is the idea. This is what I want to do. What do you think? So I got a bit of feedback. And it was, what do you think? Would you join me? Type discussion that I was having with different people. So kind of gathering... Um, influencers, gathering senior people, gathering junior people, ga gathering almost like the army or your tribe of people who yeah. understand what you're doing because you've explained it and who in some ways believe in what you're doing. And so that was the beginning of it all. And once I had a couple of them on, it, I made it kind of clear this is kind of what, w what will be needed to make it happen. So whether it's venues for events, whether it's sweets, whether it's pancakes, whatever it was, this is what I need to do let me know if you're interested kind of thing. Yeah, and so we had the like first um, bit of cash, the space, all the that rest of that kind of stuff, and then launched it and told as many people as I could, set up a Twitter account, and put out a whole load of stuff on the Twitter account, made connections with loads of different people, saw who else was in the space, what they were doing, said, okay, cool, I love what you're doing, this is what we're trying to do, why don't you come along? So I kind of did that and spread the word out. Yeah. And in doing that, you then make it easy as well for the people that you've already spoken to to then spread the word and tell others, right? So that was how it got started. Nice and, and by the launch event, I had more volunteers turn up than I knew what to do with, none of whom I'd met before, but all who'd have seen the words or heard it from someone or seen it on Twitter or whatever it was, who all then turned up. And then you kind of, you do. And, and it's almost like because you've got that many people behind you, you make sure that you do a good job. You make sure that you are diligent in what you're doing. You make sure that you do it as best as you can. You make sure that... Um, you do it as true to your word because you don't let all those people down that yeah, you've you. kind of had along with you. And you're not doing it for them, but it's that thing of if you've had enough time to donate, to give to what I'm doing, then I might as well, you know, do a good job and do it back to them and be thankful for everyone that's done it. So to, to, to this day, um, anyone, some, anytime someone drops off a note, oh, I want to help out with this, I want to help out with that, you know, how does my company get involved? You know, it's the same thing. Thanks so much for getting in touch. <laughs> Start with a thank you, and then you can go on from there. Um, so that's, that's the mechanics yeah, of it, man. really. I'm with you. Guys, that, that's gems. Like, that is literally gems. From a startup to a social enterprise, you heard it here first. Um, well, obviously, you haven't heard it here first. Yeah. I'm sure you've Someone heard it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you've gone on Google, I'm sure <laughs> you've heard. But no, it's really quite um, heartening to know. And... Um, you did mention about Twitter. Mm -hmm. You do mention about scheduling a lot of content. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, anything you want to speak about that? or uh, Working out loud is like the kind of overarching thing that it's called. So if you look that up, there's a book called Working Out Loud. Okay. It kind of talks a lot about it. And it's kind of how do you use 
So have you heard of how to win friends and influence people? Yes. Yeah. So it's that, but for the 21st century. Right. So it's how do you use social media and all those principles together for whatever you need. Guys, I'm going to try and throw that in the show notes as well, anything we discuss. You know, so you can uh, just have a little click, have a little check it out, working out loud. Gotcha. Well, honestly, this has been an absolute pleasure. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> we made it. Dun, dun, dun. And I'm going to leave you with one last question. How would you like to be remembered? Oh, I put this on the thingy. I'd like to be remembered as a person who made it normal for girls to be in tech. Wow. Simple as that. That's huge, but uh, also amazing. So yeah. we can get in touch with you via... Twitter. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat. Snapchat. On Stem X? Yeah. S-T-E-M-E-T-T-E-S. Only one M. Only one M, guys. M stands for maths. Just the one. <laughs> Once again, guys, um, thanks for joining me on this amazing episode. I hope you get in touch with Anne-Marie because she's phenomenal. She loves Twitter. She always responds to it. Well, I don't know whether she always responds to it, but... <laughs> Depends on what you're asking. Depends on what you're asking. Get all kinds of funny requests on Twitter. Um, yeah, because it's a non-profit, you know, social enterprise, always looking for volunteers, any how we can help. So, Harla, um, anything you want to... Final words? Joey Springer, anything you want to say? <laughs> Jerry Springer yeah. style. Um, no, so the, my only my motto is the other thing people have asked me. Um, so the thing I'll leave you with is to always make sure that you seek forgiveness and not permission. Mic drop. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs>We really appreciate you listening and if you have any feedback please leave it in the comment section below also all the info about the guests the links and the resources we speak about will be in the description below and last but not least please 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 do get in touch if you can teach us how you do what it is you do because after all black Ticklate is all about empowering and upskilling the community thanks guys you're the best see you soon